Author's Playhouse. Ready with the bass drum, Bobby? I'll say I am. Listen to me, Dad. <laughs> oh, that's so stuff. How about the old kazoo phone, Peter? Right in time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like a bit of all right, young fellow, my lad. All right, now here goes McNamara's band with a hot time in the old town tonight. Until the strain of overwork resulted in a tragic mental breakdown, McNamara's band was the favorite game of Philip Carr and his two young sons, Peter and Bobby. And when Philip was released after six months in a sanitarium, his wife found herself living in an agonizing fear of his every word and action. How these two people worked out the problems which faced them is compellingly told in Author's Playhouse presentation for tonight, The Long Way Round, a story by James Ronald. I'll drive, shall I, Louise? I think perhaps I'd better, Philip. Oh, okay, dear. I don't suppose it makes any difference. I only thought it'd been so long since I sat behind a wheel. I said I only thought it'd been so long since I sat behind a wheel. I heard you, Philip. You just rest. Oh. Oh, oh, uh, stop here a minute, will you, Louise? Why on earth do you want to stop here? Well, I just want to look back and see the place from the outside. Huh. An inviting-looking dump, isn't it? And those bars on the windows don't help. (laughs) Funny. I've been here for six months. And until this moment, I had no idea how it looks from the outside. I've seen all I want of it myself. I never want to see it again. Poor old girl. It was worse for you than for me. I don't know how you stood it. Coming to see me twice a week, rain or shine. If you finish looking at the place, Philip, I'll drive on. Right. The sooner the better. I've seen all of it I want. <laughs> yeah, the only place I want to look at now is home. Here. Here's a turn to Winnetka, Louise, right here. Uh, Stop the car. You've passed it. I meant to tell you, Philip. I've let the house for a year and taken one at Woodstock. It's a charming little place, restful and quiet. You'll love it. But, But we don't know anyone at Woodstock. I know that, Philip. I thought if we lived somewhere away from our friends, you... Well, you might be spared some awkward encounters. I see. Woodstock is quite a distance to commute every day. But you won't be going into Chicago. No? Why not? Well, that's something else we've got to talk about. Not now. Later. Okay. Yeah, I suppose it would be rather foolish to start back in the old grind right away. Anyway, it'll be good to see the boys. (laughs) I'm afraid you won't see them, Philip. At least not for a while. I sent them to stay with Mother. Louise. I'd hardly call them restful. I thought it best to give you time to get adjusted. Well, I've had six months of rest. A little healthy noise might be a welcome relief. Well, that wasn't the only reason, Philip. There's the question of what we're going to tell them. What do you mean? Well, of course, we may not have to tell them anything. That would be best. But if they ask questions... If they ask questions, we'll answer truthfully and honestly. We'll tell them whatever they want to know. Oh, no. They're so young, don't you think? I think there's no sense in making a mystery of the whole business. Well, they may not ask. They may simply accept the pleasant fact that you're home again. Children have such short memories. But surely you've told them something, Louise. Only that you'd gone away for a vacation. And you think they accepted that? They were there when I was taken away. Surely they saw me go. Well, didn't they? Yes. Yes, they saw you go. Ah, I thought so. 
<laughs> and if I know kids, their imaginations have been working overtime. We'd better straighten them out. Now, the truth probably isn't half as bad as the thing they've been conjuring up in their minds. I still say we'd better let matters rest as they are, Philip. I've thought everything out while... while you were away. And what I've done, I'm sure, is for the best. Here's the house. How do you like it? Oh. Well, after our own place, it looks a bit hemmed in. It's very quiet. I told you you'd love it. Uh, its lines are good. The setting's beautiful. Well, out you go. I've been looking forward to showing it to you. Yeah. It's a little small for our furniture, but I think you'll like the way I've arranged it. Oh, I know I shall. You've always had perfect taste. Now, here's the key. Silly. That's the key to... Well, go ahead. Say it. The key to home. Please, Philip. Come on. I want to show you everything. I don't want to look at everything. I want to look at you. You're very lovely, Louise. Philip. Well, that was good. I never dared to really kiss you when you came to see me at that... that place. You used to kiss me the way... the way a little boy kisses his mother. No. No more. Now, do let me show you the house. Just as you say. Here's the living room. And there, over by the window, is your chair. Oh, I oh, found exactly the right spot for it. Just as I knew you would. <laughs> ah. Oh, this is solid comfort. All that's lacking is my pipe and slippers and a highball. <laughs> there isn't a drop in the house. Oh, then I'll drive into town and get some. It isn't as easy as all that. Scotch is as scarce as hen's teeth. No, I'm not fussy. I'll settle for rye or bourbon. Philip. Perhaps you don't realize what a time I've been through. Oh, don't look at me like that, Louise. Let's not fall out the minute I get home. I only want to do what's best for you. Yeah, I know you do. But right now's a good time to set something straight, Louise. It wasn't drinking that threw me out of gear. I wish... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me finish. I know, for a while I was drinking heavily. Too heavily. But it wasn't that. I mean, not only that. I was working 14, 15, 16 hours a day, every day. It was the endless worry. It was that big housing project with 101 things going wrong with it every time I turned my head. <laughs> the wonder to me is I lasted as long as I did. How about Harry? Harry. He... Yeah, Harry. <laughs> the poor guy, I dumped the whole thing right in his lap. Uh, how's it coming along? I haven't the slightest idea. Well, hasn't Perry told you about it? I haven't seen him for months. Here, now, hold everything, Louise. I, you mustn't blame Harry. It wasn't his fault. He's your partner, but he let you work yourself into a nervous breakdown. No, that's not fair. He did his share of the work. It just happened that most of the detail of that housing project was more in my line than in his. You know old Harry, it just isn't in him to worry. No, he left the worry to you. That's not at all like you, Louise. If I'd listened to Harry, I'd have been all right. He was always at me to take it easy. Did his best to make me take time out for that fishing trip. If you don't mind, we won't talk of that. A trip I never took. <laughs> Got so for a while, it was all I could think about. I'd be sitting in the office, stewing over forms at my drafting board, trying to figure out how to make bricks without straw, and, <laughs> and all the time my mind would be up in northern Wisconsin. Tangling with those big muskies. You wouldn't have been half so ill if that fishing trip hadn't become an obsession. Oh, let's not talk about it. I should think we could start all over again as if you'd never been away. Well, I have an idea that talking about it's the only way to get it out of my system. You wouldn't treat a boil by ignoring it. Uh, I'll answer. I'm sure it's for me anyway. Uh, probably so, dear. Hello? Yes, he's home. No, he's lying down. Very well. I'll tell him. Oh, 
Why did you close the door, Louise? Oh, I don't know. I didn't even realize that I did. Who was it? Oh, this local exchange. It's forever calling the wrong number. That wasn't a wrong number. It was Harry, wasn't it? Yes, it was. But I didn't think it was worthwhile to bother you. He only wanted me to give you his regards. You might have known I'd want to talk to Harry. Oh, well, I'll... I'll run into Chicago to see him in a few days. No. Philip, I want you to promise me that you'll sell out. There's no reason for you to go back to work. We've more than enough to live on. Well, a man can't retire at 40. There are other things besides work. You could play golf. You could you could take up some kind of a hobby. I'd go crazy. Philip! Please. Please don't ever say that word. I've been helping out Louise by more or less looking after your financial affairs while you were away, Philip. All the details are here if you'd like to go over them. Jack, please don't bother Philip right now with that sort of thing. He knows we can rely on you. But after all, sis... Uh, she's right, Jack. If I can't trust my wife's brother... Oh, thanks, old man. I'm glad you feel that way about it. However, there's something that's just come up that I'd like to have you decide for yourselves. I have a tenant who's willing to pay 75 a month for the cottage. We'd better snap it up, Philip. All right, we've lived in that cottage while we were building the house. And I'm not sure if it wasn't the happiest year of our married life. It's a case of sentiment or 75 a month. Take your choice. I'll take sentiment. We can do without the 75. Uh, thanks a lot for everything you've done, Jack. I appreciate it. Philip, don't you think it might be best to leave everything in Jack's hands? It wouldn't be any bother. <laughs> I'm supposed to be all right now. Remember? Go ahead, say it. I disgraced you. I behaved like a boor, didn't I? I couldn't see any special reason for you to call Mr. Peters an unmitigated old fool. Look, a lot of things happened these six months I was away. He kept bringing up things that anyone who followed the newspapers would be bound to know. But I was stumped. I felt like saying, you know why I don't know what you're talking about. No, I'm not crazy now, but I was for six months. Philip, I've asked you before. Please. Good morning, darling. Good morning, darling. <laughs> you don't have to give me the silent treatment, Louise, just because I got tight last night. I did it purposely. It proved something I had to know. Proved I don't need to be afraid of this stuff anymore. It's lost whatever hold it may have had on me. Louise, are you listening to me? I'm busy, Philip. I'm writing a letter to Mother. Oh? Well, give her my love and uh, tell her to hurry up and send the boys back. We can't have them back yet, Philip. I really don't think I could manage the extra work. But I want to see them. I haven't laid eyes on them since before I went away. It's been almost eight months. Well, they could come up for a day. We could have a picnic. Well, a day's better than nothing. We could dig up some old junk and reorganize McNamara's band. <laughs> Philip, I think that the idea of a grown man and two boys parading around and making a lot of noise is utterly silly. It seems to me there are lots of things you and the boys could do that would be more constructive. <laughs> Dad, you're all right now, aren't you? <laughs> yes, son. I'm all right now. Gee, you were funny, Dad. Was I, Bobby? When was that? When you was fishing off the sleeping porch into the yard. You kept hollering, I got one. I got a big one. It made me kind of laugh. Go on. You were scared stiff. You were bawling. And when those men took that away, you bawled all night. And now you say it was funny. Uh, Peter, uh, Bobby. Uh, do you remember that old clock we wound up too tight? Oh, sure. I remember. So do I. Well, remember how all of a sudden it seemed to go haywire? For a minute or so, every wheel in the works went around like mad, and the little hand raced the big one around the dial. Uh, it kept whirring and striking, whirring and striking. Uh -huh. I remember. And then it let out a big kind of a twang, and all the works were jumbled up inside. And it didn't run anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 
But when we sent it to the clockmaker, it came back as good as ever. And, and, uh, do you remember what he told us? That there were 50 more years in the old clock if we took care of it. You won't let yourself get wound up too tight ever again, will you, Dad? Never again, Peter. You were funny, though. You kept saying that was the biggest muskie you ever saw. Peter, Bobby, go into the house. Your hands and faces are filthy. Go and wash. Okay, Mom. We'll be back in a little while, Dad. And then we can play McNamara's band. Right. <laughs> you... You... How could you? How could you do such a thing? No, it's quite out of the question. And that's final, do you understand? I won't have him bothered. You've got to leave him alone. Please. No, goodbye. Let me have that phone, please. Harry? Philip, how are you, old boy? I never felt better in my life. Uh, What were you phoning about, Harry? Uh, Nothing, nothing very much. Uh, Nothing for you to worry about. I'm not the worrying kind anymore, Harry. You couldn't hire me to worry. Uh, What were you and Louise talking about? What is it? Uh, Listen, Harry. If it's anything to do with the business, I want to know what it is. Well, now, if you put it that way, Phil, uh, we've been asked to design a prefabricated house for the government. And it struck me it was right up your street, but I don't... I'll be down at the office in the morning. Hey, hey, hold on a minute now. I won't have you at the office. I'll send you all the dope, and you can work it out at home. But uh, you stay away from the office. And I'm not kidding, Phil. I mean it. (laughs) All right, Harry, just as you say. But uh, don't send the specifications here. I'll phone you later and tell you where to send them. Well, what's the idea? Goodbye, Harry. What did you mean by telling Harry not to send those specifications here? It's simple. I meant that I'm leaving. You can't, Philip. You shan't leave me. I won't let you. Philip, won't you try to understand? All I've ever thought I thought I was coming home. If this is what you call coming home, we've... We've come the long way around. Maybe I've been a fool, but don't you see... Oh, you must see, Philip. I was afraid, terribly, horribly afraid. A man can't spend his days with fear. It eats his heart out, rots his insides away. I wanted you to forget. A man's made up of his experiences. He's got to be able to live with them in order to live with himself. Where are you going? I haven't even thought about that. All I've thought about is that that I've got to get away from you. I... I love you, Louise. I always have and I always will. But but you're poisoning the air I breathe. I've got to go now before I start hating you. Hello? Mother? Louise, child, whatever's the matter? I've tried to get you three times since Tuesday, but your phone must have been out of order. What's happened between you and Philip? He... He left me. Left you? Yes. Well, I thought something must be wrong the way he acted. He wouldn't talk about you at all. You... You've seen him? Well, yes. He came by yesterday afternoon and took the boys away for the weekend. Oh. Whatever's come between you, Louise? Well, I thought... I can't talk about it now, Mother. Goodbye. Mrs. Carr, Dr. Semler. Uh, How do you do? Uh, Mrs. Carr? You remember me, don't you, Dr. Semler? My husband, about eight months ago. Oh, but of course, Mrs. Carr. Forgive me, please. And uh, how is Mr. Carr doing? He was released from the sanitarium two months ago. Dr. Semler, I've got to talk to you. Certainly, Mrs. Carr. Uh, Sit down. Uh, There, please. Now, make yourself comfortable. hmm? Lie back and relax. That's right. Think of yourself as a spring, slowly unwinding. Wait until the spring is fully unwound before you try to tell me anything. 
How well do you remember my husband's case, Dr. Semler? Mm, let me see. Too much work, a little too much alcohol, something snapped. All too often it happens in these trying times. My prescription was rest and proper care. He had all that, Dr. Semler, at the sanitarium. And he was discharged after six months as completely cured. At least, they said he was. But you yourself are not certain. How can I tell, Dr. Semler? I've done everything I know to make it easy for him. I let our house in Winnetka and moved to a quiet place in Woodstock so that he'd be away from all former associations. I even sent our two boys to stay at my mother's so they wouldn't bother him with their noise. I see. Uh, Mrs. Carr, since he has been home, has he ever given any indication of returning to irrationality? No. I can't say that he has. But now he's gone back to work. To the same kind of work that drove him crazy. Uh, Mrs. Carr, let me ask you something. Do you know what an anxiety neurosis is? No. Not exactly. Then I shall tell you. It is a term which we use to describe a person who is a slave to a remote fear. I don't think you understand, Dr. Semler. I must not have explained things very clearly. Philip isn't a bit like that. Philip? Yes, my husband. He isn't like that at all. My dear young lady, we are not talking about your husband. We are talking about you. <laughs> To Winnetka, please. One way. That'll be 59 cents, please. Do you know where the car place is? Out on the lakefront? Sure, I know where it is. Get in, lady. I don't want the large house, please. I want the little cottage on the south side. Here you are, lady. Eighty-five cents. Thank you. Here, keep the change. Mom! Louise! I have a comb and some tissue paper in my handbag. Do... Do you suppose I could join McNamara's band? heard James Ronald's story, The Long Way Round, adapted for Author's Playhouse by Jack Mitchell and directed by Mr. Albert Cruz. Miss Lorette Philbrandt was heard as Louise, Mr. Ralph Camargo as Philip. Others in the cast of Author's Playhouse tonight were Mr. Armand Hunter, Mr. Sidney Mason, Miss Helen Baymiller, Master Arthur Young, and Bobby Ellis. The organ music was arranged and played by Mr. Lewis Webb. Next week, same time, same station, Author's Playhouse will bring you Robert Carson's hilarious story of Washington in wartime. A call for Mr. Garrett. This is the National Broadcasting Company.